Welcome to My Vaccine is Jesus. Today's discussion is on the response to Trinitarian questions and requests playlist and is entitled episode number 13. Before we begin, a short prayer, a blessing, honor, glory, and worship to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit for now and forever and unto ages of ages. Amen. I pray to Almighty God to be filled with Holy Spirit so I'm empowered to speak truth without error and to interpret Holy Scripture correctly. All truth comes from God. Any errors are my own. I also pray that you, the viewer and listener, may likewise be filled with the Holy Spirit so that any truth I speak or any scripture that I interpret correctly is welcomed in your heart, your mind, and your soul. Now let us begin the discussion. So we have a question on the left there from a jolly good show. Honest question. How could the angel of the Lord be the pre-incarnate Jesus in the Old Testament if the angel of the Lord appeared to them when Jesus was a young child? You know, obviously in the New Testament. Thanks for your response. Here's how I responded. Well, even though the divine son took on flesh in the person of the God-man, he never left heaven. He was not diminished in any way. He still was divine, including being omnipresent. So he could have appeared as the angel of the Lord in the New Testament, even while being present at the same time in the flesh and blood corruptible body of Lord Jesus. All right, to get into this, let's start with Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 7 here. This is talking about the word of the Lord. And in the Septuagint, in the Koine Greek, it would be the rimata to Theu, the rimata, the word, kind of where I guess where we get the name rhyme, rimata, the rimata to Theu, the word of God. And there's one reference to this in the New Testament, otherwise we'll get back to the angel of the Lord concept. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God. So notice the word of the Lord. Abraham calls Lord God. What wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus? And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he, Abram, believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. So I'm not going to get into it in this particular video, but as New Testament believers, we also understand that not just the angel of the Lord, which we're going to get into in this video, uh, in the New Testament was the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus, but the word of the Lord was as well. And what you'll see here is the word of the Lord uh, described in verse 1, called Lord God in verse 2, again called the word of the Lord in verse 4, and called the Lord in uh, verse 6, and the Lord that brought thee out of the Ur of the Chaldees in verse 7, and notice it's this person of the Lord, which is the pre-incarnate Son, who makes the promise to Abraham, and who, uh, because Abraham trusts the promise of the pre-incarnate Son here, the word of the Lord, that pre-incarnate Son, that word of the Lord, uh, counts it to him as righteousness, which is pretty cool. Now let's get into the angel of the Lord, though. That's first introduced in Genesis chapter 16. We have verses 7 through 10 and then verse 13. And the angel of the Lord found her, this is Hagar, Sarah's maid, by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur, which reminds me of John chapter 4 with the Samaritan woman, by the way. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence comest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarah. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also looked here after him that seeth me? All right, so first off, Angel in Hebrew is malak. In Greek, it's angelos, where we get the word angel. Angel means messenger. There's three kinds of angels. There's three kinds of malaks. There's three kinds of messengers. There's three kinds of angelos, right? <clears throat> there are human messengers. There are angelic spirit beings. And then there's this one particular angel of the Lord, which is what we're discussing in this video. And what makes this angel of the Lord special is he is called the angel of the Lord, and then he'll be called the Lord, he'll be called the angel of the Lord, and then he'll be called God. And he does things, and he says things that only God can do and only God can say. Notice what uh, the angel of the Lord says and promises in verse 10. 
I will, not the Lord will, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. What does that prove? The angel of the Lord has divine characteristics. He's omnipotent and he's omniscient. He's omnipotent is he's going to multiply her seed exceedingly. And he's omniscient because he knows it's not going to be numbered for multitude. And then notice, again, he's used interchangeably for God. Notice verse 13. She's referring back to the angel of the Lord, and she's calling the name of the Lord, and she calls him God. Is that the only time we see this? You'll see this over and over and over. And then the question is, is the angel of the Lord, which we'll look at in the New Testament, does that have these same exact characteristics? Because remember, there are other angels of the Lord. The difference is these don't speak as if they're God and they're not used interchangeably as God. And then, most likely, those are just angelic spirit beings and not the same particular angel, which is the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus, the pre-incarnate Son. Next time we see the angel of the Lord, Genesis chapter 2, or excuse me, 22, verses 11 through 13 here. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Not from God, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Now, I don't show this, but a few verses earlier, what's pretty cool, is Isaac states, uh, Father, I see the wood and the fire for the burnt offering, but where's the lamb? And Abraham says, basically, don't worry, Isaac, the Lord God will provide himself a lamb. Hmm, provide himself in the future. He's going to provide himself in the future as a lamb. Obviously, a foreshadowing of Lord Jesus Christ sacrificing himself as the lamb of God, right? And then, interestingly, in verse 13, they don't end up getting a lamb. They get a ram, and the ram is caught in a thicket by his horns. Again, making you think of Lord Jesus Christ, you know, during the Passion, during his crucifixion, wearing the crown of thorns. Continuing, Genesis chapter 22, verses 15 to 18. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me again, we saw in an early verse, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Again, notice the angel of the Lord is talking as if he is the Lord, right? And he's promising things or acting in ways that show divine characteristics, omnipotence, omniscience, yet again here. And again, what's interesting is he's basically saying, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And we know that who is that seed? The seed of Abraham, the seed of the woman is Lord Jesus Christ. So notice this is the pre-incarnate son basically prom promising uh, to Abraham that his physical descendant, is going to be, and you'll see this coming up, is actually going to be when this pre-incarnate son, this angel of the Lord, takes on human flesh. Then, Genesis chapter 31, verses 11 through 13. And the angel of God spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here am I. And he said, Lift up now thine eyes and see all the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring streaked, speckled, and grizzled. For I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, and where thou vowest to vow unto me, now arise, get thee out from this land, and return unto the land of thy kindred. So notice it's the angel of God, but then that angel of the God says, I am the God of Bethel. And you you uh, vowed a vow unto me. So again, notice this is obviously not a human messenger, and this is not just an angelic spirit being. This is a unique messenger of God, a unique messenger of the Lord that speaks as if he is the Lord, but you'll see a, a distinction, just like you see in John 1, where the word was with God, but the word was God. So this angel of God, this angel of the Lord, is with God, is with the Lord, but then is God, is the Lord. Same concept. Genesis chapter 32, uh, verses 24 to 30. Now, it doesn't say it's an angel, but this is that same being, the pre-incarnate son. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And I'm not going to show this as well, but we know in the New Testament the, the, you know, the divine son took on human flesh and became a human, you know, from an embryo and was born and was a child, et cetera, et cetera, infant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
Now, in the Old Testament, the pre-incarnate son didn't become a human, but there are times, and this is one of them here in Genesis chapter 32, where he looks like a human. You'll see this here. You'll see this, and I'm not going to show it, in Genesis chapter 18. You'll see it coming up in Joshua chapter 5, where he appears as a man. Understand there are other theophanies in the Old Testament when certain prophets see Almighty God on his throne, for example. You'll see that in in, uh, Exodus with Moses. You'll see that in Daniel chapter 7. You'll see that in uh, Ezekiel chapter 1. And throughout Ezekiel, you'll see that in in Isaiah chapter 6. And at that time, it might uh, have certain human characteristics, but then it doesn't doesn't describe him as a man. Like this is described as a man. Okay, anyway, let's look at it. Genesis chapter 32, again, verses 24 through 30. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him, and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost after, ask after my name? And he blessed him there. Notice he doesn't tell him his name. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. So notice, by calling the place Peniel, Jacob is saying, I wrestled with God. And what does Israel mean? He who struggles with God. So it's interesting. His name was Jacob because he grabbed his older brother by the heel, right? And then this is the pre-incarnate son. So this is the, 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 the divine son who ends up taking up flesh as the person of Jesus Christ. So this is, you know, basically the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ who names him Israel. So what's cool about all this stuff is we're supposed to be Jacob and we're supposed to be Israel. So we're the younger brother that grabs our older brother by the heel. That heel, by the way, that you know crushes the head of the serpent and the serpent bites you know, on the cross with that first uh, nail probably being thrust through there and takes us through the water, right? The water of the Holy Spirit, the water of baptism, out of the darkness of death into light, in the case of Jacob grabbing his older brother Esau. And Esau, what, was red and hairy. And our older brother is the Lamb of God who was slaughtered, right? Red and hairy. And then Israel, he who struggles with God. We don't struggle against God. We struggle with God in this world to help God and the Holy Spirit spread the gospel to our fellow humans uh, so that we can join the family and the family of God can be large, as, po- as large as possible. Exodus Chapter 3, verses 2 through 6. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, Moses, in a flame of fire, flux piros, out of the midst of a bush. By the way, the, uh, in Daniel chapter 7, the throne of the, uh, the Ancient of Days is described as a flux piros. And in the book of Revelation, you'll see Lord Jesus Christ with eyes as a flux piros several times. And by the way, when he comes uh, for the wrath of God, it's also described that his angels kind of descend as a flux piros too. Out of the midst of a bush, by the way, it's a thorn bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. So notice, that's just a, basically a, a foreshadowing of what's going to happen in Gehenna, because thorn represents sin. And notice this burning bush, this bush of sin burns and is not consumed, just like the sin will burn and burn and burn in Gehenna and not be consumed. There's no annihilation. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why? The bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see God, called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. So notice again, it's the angel of the Lord in verse 2. It's the Lord and God in verse 4. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and and Jacob and the God of thy father in verse 6. And notice Moses is afraid to look upon God. So again, notice angel of the Lord, interchangeable with Lord and God, etc. Continuing verses 14 through 
through uh, 15 here. And God, right, the angel of the Lord, said unto Moses, I am that I am. Eye aser eye, ero emi oon. So notice, who said all that was the pre-incarnate son, the angel of the Lord. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord, yod heh Jehovah, Yahovah, Yahweh, God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. So notice, it's the angel of the Lord, it's the pre-incarnate son, called God, who declares himself, I am that I am, Ero amio on, Easer Eye, who declares himself, Yod he vav he. Pretty amazing, huh? Exodus chapter 17, verses 5 through 6. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand, and go, Behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb. Horeb. Pay attention to this, because we're going to look at um, uh, um, uh, uh, some writings of St. Paul, and you'll see who, who this rock was. I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink, and Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now, it doesn't say it was the angel of the Lord, but it says it was the Lord. And I'll show you in the New Testament that we know that was the, 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 the son, the pre-incarnate son. It had to be. Exodus chapter 23. Now, here is where there is a distinction between God and this angel. So this is the Lord speaking. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place where I have prepared. So you see this distinction between Lord God and this angel. Beware of him, this angel, and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. So notice he's divine. Why? Because he can pardon sin. And as we know, only God can pardon sin. So this angel is also God, but not the same God sending this angel. Just like the New Testament, right? The Son forgives sin. The Son is not the Father, but was sent by the Father. For my name is in him. His name, the family name, the name of God is in him, in his substance. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, notice you're going to obey his voice, and by doing so you're going to doing all that God speaks. Again, do you see? Then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. Joshua chapter 5, I referred to this earlier, verses 13 through 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho. By the way, Joshua is the English rendering of Yehoshua, and Jesus is the Greek rendering of Joshua or Yehoshua, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand, this man holding a sword. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. So notice, He's not for them. He's not for the people of Jericho. There, meaning the Israelites, are for him. He's the captain of the host of the Lord on earth. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? Notice this man with the sword, who's the captain of the host of the Lord on earth, allows himself to be worshipped, and only God can be worshipped. And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot for the place whereon thou standest is holy, which is exactly what the angel of the Lord said to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, and Joshua did so. Notice, he's going to be the captain of the armies of the Lord on earth, which are human armies, right? Israelites fighting these wicked humans in Jericho. Judges chapter 13, we got verse 15, and then we got verses 17 through 20, and then verse 22. And Manoah, that's the father of Samson, said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee, an uh, animal sacrifice. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, what is thy name that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do, do the honor? Remember when uh, Jacob wrestled that man, who was the same entity as this, he asked for his name. Remember that man, that was the pre-incarnate son, uh, named him Israel and would not tell him his name. Why do you ask after my name? Um, again, uh, what is thy name that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor? And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? In Hebrew, it's Pele. Show other uh, renderings in different English translations in a moment. So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock 
unto the Lord, and the angel did wondrously. And Manoah and his wife looked on, for it came to pass when the flame went up, notice it goes up in a flame toward heaven from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. It ascends in the sacrifice. Again, kind of foreshadowing the Lord Jesus, being the sacrifice, and then ascending to the Father. And Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground, heaven, uh, um, heaven from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar, uh, it's a typo there, forgive me. And Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. In verse 22, and Manoah said unto his wife, we shall surely die, die because we have seen God. So notice they've seen the angel of the Lord. They've seen God. We've seen the same concept earlier. Now let's get into that verse 18. Secret is one rendering here in the King James Version. In the New King James, and the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? Sing it is wonderful, which is my preferred rendering, and I'll sh show you why. New International Version, he replied, Why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. New Living Translation, Why do you ask my name? The angel of the Lord replied, It is too wonderful for you to understand. Brian Study Bible, Why do you ask my name? Said the angel of the Lord, Because it is, since it is beyond comprehension. Pele, secret, wonderful, beyond understanding, too wonderful to understand, beyond comprehension. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Obviously a prophecy of the male child Messiah to come. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Pele. His name is the name of the angel of the Lord. Counselor, the mighty God, Il Gabor, only used for Almighty God in Isaiah chapter 10. Otherwise, the everlasting Father, or the Father of eternity, or the Father of eternal life. And uh, we know that in the uh, New Testament, how do we get eternal life? By believing upon the name of the Son. Thus, the Son is the Father or the sur source excuse me, of eternal life, the Prince of Peace. And below in the Greek there, I'm not going to go over it all. This is again in the Koine Greek Septuagint written by, you know, uh, uh, Greek-speaking Jewish scribes at least two centuries before the time of Lord Jesus. And notice what his name is going to be. Megalis Bulis Angelos, the angel of the high council. So they even knew that the angel of the Lord was going to be born as a human, was going to be the Messiah, etc. So hopefully your question's being answered. Uh, jolly good show. Let's continue. Now let's get into the New Testament. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, Mark chapter 1, verse 7, Luke chapter 3, verse 16, and John chapter 1, verse 27. I and D's, this is going back to the Exodus uh, 3 reference and Joshua 5 reference, where the angel of the Lord, the captain of the, uh, the, host, uh, of the, the armies of the Lord, uh, basically stated, you know, take off your shoes, the ground where you stand is holy ground. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And preach, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latchet I am not worthy to unloose. Isn't that amazing? The angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate son, says to Moses, says to Joshua, Take off your shoes. The ground where you stand is holy. And in the case of uh, Joshua chapter 5, he accepts worship, right? And then here you have John the Baptist basically prophesying that when Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, shows up, he's not worthy to even touch his shoe to take it off. John chapter 5, verse 45 through 47, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. And part of his writings are of the angel of the Lord. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? John chapter 8, verse 56 to 58, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So Abraham interacted with the son, the pre-incarnate son. And we probably saw some of those. And again, there also was um, uh, Genesis chapter 18, we didn't go over. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am, ero emi. And again, in Exodus chapter 3, it was the angel of the Lord speaking out of the burning bush, who declared himself, I am that I am, eieserie, ero emi, o on. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. Remember, I, I mentioned this earlier about 
how it was the Lord standing before him on the rock and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed him and that rock was Christ. So that Lord that was there at the rock when Moses struck it that first time and by the way the second time was Christ. That's what St. Paul teaches right there. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 we're going to look at the New King James Version. Therefore God also, God the Father, ha has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, given him back the name of Jehovah, yod heh vav -Heh, Yahovah, Yahweh. And again, it was the angel of the Lord who declared himself yod heh vav -Heh first. We saw that again in Exodus chapter 3. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Remember I mentioned that? Flux piros. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. There's our older uh, red and hairy brother, right? And his name is called the Word of God. This is Logos to Theu, not not uh, Rimata to Theu. And the armies which were in heaven followed him. Now these, I'm not getting into it, I mentioned in other videos, these Armies aren't angelic spirit beings. These are saved believers now in glorified uh, spiritual bodies. This is the bride of Christ. I guess they're coming down on their honeymoon here. Clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword. Here is he with the, holding the sword, that with it the sword of truth. He should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, Let's get into the angel of the Lord references in the New Testament. So, and it's not necessarily whether it's the angel or an angel. It's, is this just an angelic spirit being or is this this unique messenger that's the, that's the son, that's the pre-incarnate son. And again, as I mentioned, you know, God is God, Jesus is God. When Jesus was, you know, there and when, when the, the, you know, the eternal son was incarnate, he still was in heaven. He still was holding the universe together. So if he chose to appear as the angel of the Lord or the word of God, he could if he so chose. Now let's look at these to see, Does the are these angels, do they have those unique characteristics? Are they speaking as God? Are they declaring certain divine abilities? So Matthew chapter 1 verse 20, But we thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So could that just be any angel of the Lord, angelic spirit being? It could. Could it be the angel of the Lord? It could be, but it doesn't have to be. Notice it's not declaring himself God, declaring divinity. And then verse 24, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. Now, in the NIV, but after he had, in verse 20, but after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. There's the Koine Greek below, and it just says, Agilos Kirio. There's no distinguishing. So you could translate that as an angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. Now again, calling it the angel of the Lord is going to bring up what we said in the Old Testament. So, you know, if I were doing the translating, Unless you know it is, and it could have been, but there's nothing necessarily that states it had to be. So Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be there thou until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Again, there's, could, could it be the angel? It could be. Could it just be an angel? Of course it could be. Is that angel declaring himself God? No. Is that angel showing divine characteristics? No. And then Matthew 2.19, this is all in the King James, but when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Now, in the Greek, in both verses, it says, Agelos Kirio. Agelos Kirio. There's no distinguishing. So, was this the angel of the Lord? I, if I, I maybe, well, maybe it could be, but there's really nothing that suggests that it had to be. And again, it really doesn't take away from anything we talked about earlier. Um, Luke chapter 2, verse 9, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. They were sore afraid. And by the way, it says, Angelos Kirio. And again, there's nothing that suggests that that angel is not speaking as God, not showing di divine characteristics. Now, remember I started with um, uh, Genesis chapter 15 with the word of God, Rimata Tutheu. 
Okay, Luke chapter 3, verse 2. Annas and Caiaphas, being the high priest, the word of God, came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And then John chapter 1, verse 33. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water. So putting it together, that must have been the word of God. Not logos tutheu, but rimata tutheu. The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So, was this the pre-incarnate Son? <laughs> Most incarnate. Again, I'm going to show when that when when the, the divine Son took on flesh, he was not diminished. So, personally, personally, and there's no proof of this one way or the other, but if you had to ask me, this is my opinion, the angel of the Lord references in the New Testament are just angelic spirit beings, but I think this word of the Lord who came um, to John in the wilderness, who John right here is is stating, this was the one that told me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and reigning upon, that's going to be that, that he who baptizes with the Holy Ghost. I actually think that is the divine son. Now, here's the response from Jolly Good Show. Thank you for a response, although you don't seem to have given any scriptural proof that Christ never left heaven. He didn't ask for that, but I guess that's what he was looking for. In fact, the Bible teaches that he took on flesh and came to reside with the Jews with respect. It does teach that, but let's go over that it, 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 he's not diminished. All right, here was my response. You're welcome. Sorry, but you didn't ask me for scriptural proof. I misunderstood exactly what you were asking. Here it is. John 1.18, John 3.13, John 5.19, John 10.30, Philippians 2.6, Hebrews 1.3, Hebrews 13.8, need more. And please, for future reference, be precise in your questions so I can answer them to your satisfaction. Thanks. So hopefully I don't come across as a jerk uh, responding that way. Now, let's get into this. All right, so the idea, so second point. So hopefully we've proven that that, that one particular angel in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, who speaks as God, and shows divine characteristics was the pre-incarnate son. And you see uh, evidence of that in the New Testament that we went over. Now those New Testament references of the angel versus an angel of the Lord, who knows? Personally, I believe that's just an angelic spirit being. But I, again, like I thought the Rimata Tutho, I think that would be Lord Jesus, the divine son in kind of a different form interacting with, um, with John, even though at the same time that divine son was in the you know, physical corruptible body of Jesus of Nazareth. John 1, 18, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So notice is, present tense, is. So the Father and the Son are always together. So even though that Son took on flesh, he was still with the Father because he's God and God is omnipresent. John chapter 2, verse 11, the beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cain of Galilee manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. So notice, he was always divine. He had his own divine power. But when in that human body, he did not access it purposefully. And he only performed miracles after the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost descended and remained upon him. I guess to give us an example, because he joined with humanity and he wanted to follow certain rules of humanity. And even his miracles, remember what he would tell the disciples, you're going to be able to do these things too. And I imagine any believer could, if they're spiritually developed enough, do the things that Lord Jesus did while on earth, you know, cast out demons, raise the dead, etc. John chapter 3, verse 13, this is explicit. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So notice what he's telling Nicodemus. This is the King James rendering. Many of the Greek manuscripts state that last sentence there, that last portion. Some don't. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So again, notice what he's telling Nicodemus. Nicodemus, I'm here with you at night. And I'm in this physical corruptible body, but guess what? I am still in heaven, right? He wasn't diminished, just like I said. So again, if he wanted to appear as the angel Lord of the word of the Lord, of course he could. John chapter 5, verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth. He sees the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, he does. These also doeth or does the Son. So notice, the fa- he's seeing, what do you mean? He's seeing the Father do things. So Father do things where? Father do things in heaven. So again, he's showing he was still in heaven. He sees the Father do things in heaven. He does the things in heaven, right? And again, 
all reality, the spiritual and physical dimensions are held together by God, right? And you're going to see it's held together by the word of the Son. So he had to still be in heaven. He didn't just leave heaven and uh, the, the triune God lost one of the members of the family. No, he was both places. He's omnipresent. He's God. John chapter 6, verse 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth light unto the world. Okay, we know that's Lord Jesus coming down from heaven. Continuing, John 6, 38, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me, the will of the Father, which is for all men to see and believe upon the Son, so that the Son can grant them eternal life and they can be raised by the Son on the last day. And then pay attention to this verse. John 6, 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. So notice what came down from heaven was him taking on flesh, which again, it doesn't necessarily mean he, he didn't leave heaven. He's still in heaven. He has to be. Uh, notice this, John 10, 30. I and my Father are one. They're one being, they're one family, they're one essence. They're not just one in purpose. And again, the Jews knew he was declaring himself to be God because they picked up stones to stone him when he said this. And he didn't correct them saying, no, 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 I wasn't saying that I'm God. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't state that at all because he was. Also saying he's in union with his father in purpose, but he's in union with his father in his entity, in his essence. The father and the son are inseparable. They're both God, the one God, the one family the one being on the throne. John chapter 14, verse 10, Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? So notice, it wasn't just Lord Jesus in that body. He came, they're always together. Lord God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. So Lord God was, the Father was in the Son, even in that physical body. The words that I speak unto you and the Father in me, I, someone knows I'm in the Father, and the Father, again, would be on the throne, so he's there with him, the Father's with me here. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the work. So the Father was dwelling in him, and guess what? He was dwelling in or with the Father in heaven at the same time. So yes, it does teach, going back to Jolly Good Show, that he took on flesh and came to reside with the Jews. He did, but it also teaches he never left heaven. He can't, he couldn't. John chapter 16, verse 32, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. So the Father's with him, and he's with the Father. John chapter 17, verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was, and he still was in glory with the Father. John 17, verse 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. They were together before creation. They were always together, and they always will be together. One being one family, perfect, inseparable, perfect union. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was in the form of God, right? He's divine. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's the one on the throne, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And again, when it says not robbery to be equal with God, well, what's robbery? Taking something you don't own. So what's not robbery? Taking something you do own. So he owned being equal with God, equal in essence. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, 8, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant. It was made in the likeness of man. All this made is talking about that bread, that flesh, the flesh body, the created body. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So he was able, if he so choose, chose, to use his divine power, and he didn't. The only divine power he used is when, again, the Holy Spirit uh, descended and remained upon him as a, as a pattern for us. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, again, referring to the Son in, in connection to the Father, who being the brightness of his glory. So the Son is the brightness of the Father's glory and the express image of his person. And here, look at this, and upholding all things by the word of his power. He upholds all things, all things in heaven, all things in earth, every molecule in the universe. So obviously, when he was in that physical body, he was still holding all the molecules of the universe and the spiritual dimension together as well. So, of course, he didn't just exist inside that limited to be excited of that uh, physical corruptible flesh and um, blood body that was you know created in the womb of the Blessed Virgin uh, with the um, help of the Holy Spirit etc when he had by himself purged our sins again he purges sins just like we saw in Exodus in terms of the angel of God sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high 
Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, being made so much better than the angels. This is referring to his resurrected body. So when they talk about made, obviously talking about his divine essence. That's not made, that's uncreated, that's eternal. They're speaking of his physical body, his initial physical corruptible body that was made lower than the angels, and then his glorified, resurrected, spiritual flesh and bone body being referred to here, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, and we know that's the name of Jehovah from other cross-referencing. Hebrews chapter 1, this is the um, Father speaking to the Son, and thou, Lord, notice the Father is calling the Son Lord Kyrios, which the Greek-speaking Jews is, you know, would use to refer to Yodevave Kyrios. So the, notice, the, in a way, the um, Father's calling the Son Jehovah right there, in a way. In the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. Notice he created the heaven, he created the earth with his hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they, in terms of the heaven and earth, all shall wax old as doth the garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. So notice, he was the creator, together with the Father and Spirit, of the heaven and earth, and he is going to be the one who, as a vesture, shall fold up the heaven and the earth. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, but we see angel who is made a little lower than the angels. Again, this is his, uh, that I referred to earlier, his physical corruptible body, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, there it is. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever, right? So when you re see Revelations and you see the Lamb, that's the Son, right, in the glorified body. But then you see the one on the throne. Guess what that is? The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So the same exists in Revelation. Well, the same existed during the Gospels, right? So the, the difference was in the Gospels, he was in the body made lower than the angels, and he was on earth. And in Revelation, he's in the body made greater than the angels, and he's in heaven. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5, 7, 10, and 12. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God. The heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Who's the word of God? Lord Jesus. Verse 7, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, the word of God, Lord Jesus, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So notice, the word of Lord Jesus created the heaven and earth sustains the heaven and earth and are gonna you're gonna see are gonna destroy the old heaven and earth uh, verse 10 but the day of the lord will come as a thief in the night we know that is the day of lord jesus in the day uh, excuse me in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up by the way we saw this earlier i didn't mention it in the references of uh, john the baptist of you know him saying one coming after me whose latch it um, you know, the, the, the latch of shoe I'm unworthy to unloosen. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He's going to baptize the whole world with fire here when the world is destroyed and the new heaven and new earth are created. Again, though, we're going to see the destruction of the old heaven and the old earth coming up in Revelation 20 and in the next chapter, which I'm not going to show is the creation of the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, verse 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. So there's the day of the Lord that comes as the thief, which is the day of Lord Jesus. It's the day of God because Jesus is God. Wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Revelation chapter 5, verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I sing. Notice all created sentient beings. Every created thing is in one category. And what are they saying? Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, Almighty God, the family of God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and unto the Lamb, the God man, Lord Jesus, the divine person, the Son who took on flesh, who now is in that, you know, incorruptible, immortal, spiritual flesh and bone body forever and ever. So notice you have all creation on one side and the uncreated on the other side, which is Almighty God and the Lamb. And again, the Lamb is uncreated because his divine essence. Remember, he's the God-man. Though the God part of him, God's greater than man, right? So he's in the uncreated category, even though he ha does have a created uh, flesh and bone body there. Revelation 20, 11. This is the great white throne judgment, right? The judgment of the sheep and the goats, but in the book of Revelation. I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it. It's Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. Wait a minute. If the earth and the heaven flee and no place is found for them being destroyed, that's getting back to what we saw referred to in Hebrews and the epistle of uh, St. Peter. So hopefully your questions there are answered. And again, the Son, 
pre-incarnate son was the angel of the Lord, that particular messenger of the Old Testament. Now, these New Testament references, really, it could go either way. Yeah, and, and if that would be the son doing that, doesn't take away from anything. It surely could have been. But there's really nothing in it that suggested had to be. Again, even though there's nothing that suggested had to be, I personally think those Word of God mentions in the New Testament are the son of basically communicating with John the Baptist, which is kind of cool if that is indeed true, which I think it is. I pray I spoke truth and interpreted the scripture correctly so that this discussion might have been a blessing to you, the viewer and listener. All truth comes from God. Any errors were my own. If it was a blessing to you, I would greatly appreciate. If you could like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel, Lord willing, we shall meet again. May the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless us all. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.